everybody in. <laughs> Hi everyone, thank you so much for your patience. There is just a little like me running from class and then as, hey class, <laughs> and then also, um, uh, you know, technical items that one was trying to do. So thank you for all your patience. And, you know, this is kind of informal. So people will be coming in maybe a little later too. Um, and um, I wanted to welcome you to the Eco Art Salon for April and um, also acknowledge that um, Rutgers is on the unceded territory of the Lenape Lunape um, Nation to acknowledge uh, their community's past and their present and their future. Um, but I also wanted to uh, note that um, I wanted to thank our uh, supporter, uh, the host, uh, Paul Robeson Galleries and also um, the Price Institute, the Clement A. Price Institute at Rutgers University in Newark. And that this uh, particular salon was actually put together with the Eco Art Salon Committee, who many of you might know, um, Colleen um, O'Neill, as well as Crystal Robinson, and with the ECHOES group, which is Ecology, Culture, History, um, open Sound Lab, and um, that is a uh, research cluster at Rutgers uh, Newark as well. And so they came together to curate a series of um, uh, eco art salons, and this is the second of them. And so we're so happy to have um, Tamia Han as well as Noel Lorraine Williams, who is an alum of the American Studies program. I know there are several of folks that are kind of connected to that here. So. Um, so they will be discussing their work today, um, thinking about sensing and reclaiming, and also different uh, other different themes that relate to it, such as erasure, isolation, um, thinking about our environments, right, and the body. Um, and so Noelle is going to talk about a range of her work, and uh, Tamia is going to lead us on a workshop. So after they present and uh, we go on the workshop, we're going to then break either break out or stay together, depending how the group feels, okay? Um, and that's when, um, actually we're, we're being streamed live right now on Facebook, um, just so you know that too. But then during that period, then we're gonna stop so we can really feel free to, you know, um, talk about um, whatever you want about your works, your the ideas. Um, it's meant to be a place to connect to if you have, you know, thoughts about possible collaborations that that's happened, you know, in the past, um, and you know, just many other things to get to know people. Um, this happens every month, so you're always invited back every month. So um, right now, I'm just going to introduce the artists, um, so, um, and Noel will be speaking first. Um, Noel Lorraine Williams lives and works in Newark, New Jersey. She's a graduate of the New School for Social Social Research and Rutgers University, Newark. As a public humanities specialist, artist, researcher, and curator, her work examines the ways African Americans utilize culture to reimagine liberation in the U.S. She has exhibited and lectured at the Newark Museum, the African American Museum in Philly, um, Jersey City Museum, um, Skylight Gallery in Brooklyn, and Q Art in Manhattan. Um, she recently received the Creative Catalyst Grant from the City of Newark um, with Newark Arts, and she's a recipient of the 2021 Individual Artist Fellowship Award for Crafts from New, York, uh, New Jersey State Council on the Arts. And she continues to make art, curate, teach, and write about history, African-American women's lives, and liberated communities in the U.S. And she has a current project, Black Power 19th Century, and a website that you can visit, um, which is www.blackpower19thcentury.com. We, we can put it in the chat. Um, so welcome, Noelle. Hey. Hey, Colleen. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Good to be here. So um, are you going to do um, Tomi's bio now or? Oh, I can introduce her before her, um, her work. Oh, oh, okay, so I'm going, I'm jumping into the double dutch first. Okay, so good evening, everyone. I am so happy to be here. Um, and I'm really just excited to see what comes out of this conversation. Um, I've been thinking, just thinking in the past couple of days, just looking at um, Tommy's work and thinking about environment um, and how it relates to my work has just given me more thoughts about my own practice. So um, I always believe that dialogue 
brings us to like a more authentic understanding of our reality. So I'm here for it. So I'm gonna actually share my screen with you all uh, and share some of my work. Uh, so can you all see the screen? It should be loading. Okay, awesome. Great. So actually, let me minimize everyone else. So today's title that we all settled on was Sensing and Reclaiming. Um, so where I want to start, because today we're going to be speaking, um, I'm going to be speaking on my photography and collage work, um, how it relates to history and memory in my own environment. I realized that a lot of the project of my life has really been about um, my environment, where I'm from, um, and also my psychic environment. So um, my psychic environment, as far as feeling a part of this project um, called um, America, North America. So one of the things that's come up over the past couple of nights is that I came to something that I actually used, used to be at the forefront of my work um, a couple of years ago. Well, actually not a couple of years ago, 15 years ago. And it was kind of like having this conversation with my six-year-old, eight-year-old and nine-year-old self. So right here, what I'm showing you guys is actually a screenshot from Google Maps of where there used to be a playground um, near my house my apartment in Jersey City. Um, this playground had like a couple, if um, for those of us who were here during the 80s, um, there were a lot of community projects and folks would take like tires and other recycled goods and they would create these community playgrounds that were sometimes really interesting and then sometimes fall into disrepair. And I remember standing, looking at this site, which didn't look like this then, just imagine with me um, um, a whole tract of dirt um, with some tires and some slides and all these folks trying to create this um, community for youth there. And I would just wonder like, um, is there more? You know, as a young girl, just walking the streets by myself, is there more? Uh, so it looks like there were other people thinking about this too. So I actually found this 2010 Martin Luther King Drive redevelopment plan area, which actually right here in this purple section in the middle is where the um, area or the playground was located in this little corner right over here. Um, and so I see one of their goals was to pursue the need for public facilities that address the social and cultural needs of the community. So it's interesting. So even though there's actually, there was actually an initiative during the 80s and there was an initiative during 2010, but how like as youth, or we could not be aware of these initiatives, but thinking the same things, right? So I also frequented Newark. We moved to Newark when I was um, maybe around 11. Um, so I guess that was 1987. And one of the things about Newark, we used to come shopping here before we actually moved here. Um, I was always just kind of taken by these long tracts of land where things were just, again, missing. I was very obsessed with this between the ages of five and, and 12. Like I was just always wondering why there, there couldn't be more playgrounds or more like community dinners, things like that. And so um, over here, I have an image from Manuel Acevedo, a Newark artist. Um, this is a series he did in 1998. Um, and it's an image of a street in Newark. And this is kind of like what I remember a little of traveling from Jersey City coming over to New York. Um, and then also going back even before I was born, I pulled an image um, 
from Newark 1967, when the police and National Guard occupied Black neighborhoods here. This has been called um, the riots, or it's been called the rebellion. Um, but the most important thing that it hasn't been called is an occupation of a Black neighborhood. And the whole introduction of violence and isolation within a place where people were living, where people literally were murdered inside of their homes. So one of the things um, my art and other artists from that period, what our work speaks to is the violence or isolation or beauty um, that's inherent in our environment and that is existing all at the same time. So these various realities, right? So this violence, this isolation um, and this beauty, one of the, um, I, I did this collage of two newspaper articles. One was um, um, in 1967, it's a headline Dur from Durham Morning Herald, and it says, another Newark threatened here. So as early as one month after the Newark rebellion, um, there were already people around the, the country branding Newark as a violent and disruptive space. But what I wanted to juxtapose that with was with an image that was taken, I believe, a couple of years later. And it was in the Star Ledger um, of African American men in Weekwake Park who were praying on their knees at the park. One of the aspects of the 1960s that's rarely discussed in a serious manner is the ways that African Americans um, engage different religions, including Islam, as a way to find peace um, and also to build up the environment of their lives, right? Um, and so what this piece or what this article speaks to is this juxtaposition of realities. So my initial statement for the series I'm presenting to you today um, was called Isolation Refreshed. And this was the original statement and it was, um, why? Where is everyone? Ever since I was younger, I've loved and wanted more from the streets. The woman in these photographs is my character, Mala. Um, in Spanish, that's translated to bad or rotten. Name that because she defies the notions of how her most intimate and larger community feels that she should be as a black woman and poor. Um, now I would only, I would actually capitalize the black in capital B. But in this piece, Mala awakens to see that all that she has known now is abandoned, left, gone to ruin. The environment is indeed Mala. Much like my own seven-year-old self that wondered why did I live in the land of failed projects of the 60s and 70s, overrun community gardens, dilapidated buildings, grown-ups who were just trying to sleep, and profoundly beautiful intoxicants. Journeying in through dried poppies, abandoned streets, unable to stay awake, she walks back to see the image that perhaps has made her fall asleep. So I then, the title at that time was actually a URL that um, included the year I did the series and also 1967 and also the year um, in which I believe Emmett Till was murdered. Um, and so I called it a Neo Meditation on Emotions, Post-Industrial, Post-Riot, Post-American Dream Space. So the image starts on a street in downtown Newark and for this piece, what I decided to do was kind of base it on like uh, Alfred Hitchcock kind of dystopia, like um, of, of being in a twilight zone, right? So the emotional, um, the emotional vocabulary I wanted to have with the public um, or dialogue that I wanted to have with the public was engaging folks, um, oh, I don't know what that is. Um, was engaging folks um, and what it meant to kind of feel like um, you were in a different world. Um, and so here you can see the white shoes that I have there for my ancestors. And I start this as I'm asleep. So I wake up and I'm looking inside of buildings and I'm trying to understand what has happened. So basically I fell asleep during the Newark um, rebellion, and I'm just trying to understand where everybody has gone. Um, 
And so I look inside of the building and this is actually a historical photo um, that is um, what I would have seen if I had looked inside of the building. I'm sure inside it's in more disrepair than this image, but um, this gives the audience a sense of what I'm seeing. Um, in this image, it, it expresses my real frustration, um, even outside of my art performative um, or communication or narrative I'm trying to share, of uh, literally trying to open up buildings and open up spaces, which has now been translated into my research work um, and also like place work. But you see the character, she's literally trying to open the buildings um, to see what has happened. Um, and then she fits, she's resigned um, or just trying to understand what her next steps will actually be. So um, in the following image, you see her walking down a street. This is Tree Street in downtown Newark. I'm really excited to be speaking to you all because I know that many of you are like students here in Newark. So hopefully you'll visit some of these streets if you haven't. Um, and um, if you have, then um, maybe you'll recognize it. Um, and over here, you'll see that after walking through the images, which were actually poppies. So I decided to use these dried yellow poppies um, coming out of the abandoned building. Um, and the poppies speak to the heroin trade and, and that, that many activists felt after it just kind of like came in, you know, the government dropped it in and, and worked to destroy African-American communities, but they were not successful um, as evident by some of us who are still living and fighting now. Um, but these poppies then become a symbol of that. Um, and so one of the things though, is that as for many of you that are familiar with heroin or this type of drug addiction is that it makes you very sleepy. Um, and so this whole aspect of being sleepy may also be something that folks are familiar with um, in other like religious systems that often describe this whole process of becoming more engaged in your spirituality as being awake. So that sleepiness actually becomes this disengagement from yourself and the world. And so our, our lives are, you know, the journey to become more awake. So after she wakes up, she's walking down the street and she realizes that, in fact, she is no longer in 1967, but that this issue is still continuing. So this magazine by used to be a magazine that existed during the 1990s. I think actually Vibe ended in the 2000s. So this is this would be a contemporary magazine, like, I don't know, um, Teen Vogue or something. So what she sees now is that Emmett Till is on the cover and people are de um, demanding justice. As you all know, um, Emmett Till was the boy who was murdered in the South um, for what these white men consider to be inappropriate behavior. Um, and they murdered him and they shot him um, and dumped his body in a river, tied his neck with um, um, a wire and dropped him down there with a fan. Um, and why Emmett Till is so significant to the world um, is that Mamie Till, his mother, um, decided to show the image of Emmett Till in his bloated face and his um, defaced body to the world and it exposed the whole world to the type of violence that African Americans um, were experiencing in the United States. So in this case, in Mala, even though it's 2006, she's seeing that this is still continuing. Um, and then the next scene, what we see is that we're trying to kind of understand like what's going on. We see this man, this is actually a fellow artist colleague of mine. And um, we come to see that this was actually all a program um, on a computer. 
So interestingly, um, three years ago, two years ago, um, Rebecca Jampol with Four Corners Art, they put out a call for art on Street Street, which was actually the street that I just showed you all the display on. Um, and this is actually a building next to the building where you all saw me pulling on the bars, right? And this, just to relay that, these are streets that I regularly walk and I regularly imagine on um, and I regularly think about and study. Um, and so um, we were invited to participate in the murals um, and the theme was that it had to relate to history here in New York. So what I decided to do is I've been collecting images of black women who were photographed in downtown New York in the late 19th century. And so my project um, was called To Be Seen uh, because for many African Americans taking photographs of themselves um, during the late 19th century was a part of reclaiming their humanity and stepping into this new life as um, free beings. Um, and so this is all a part of this project I'm doing, Black Power 19 centurycom um, Actually, as you can see, this is just all a further articulation of the work that I've been doing as an activist and as an artist for now over 30, for almost 30 years, but in different iterations. So this is an image that I'm not using in the exhibition as an image, but more as an illustration to be able to show folks um, how here at Broad and Market, um, there was an African-American woman and her children for sale. So you see a Google map screen grab on the left, and then you see what, what I did was I took a historical image and I had someone redraw it because it was very like, just, it was just very messed up. And then I actually took a historical photo of an African-American woman for sale. And I juxtaposed all of the elements to actually describe a real life event um, in the, actually the 18th century where a black woman and three of her children were being sold where it's now a fried chicken spot on Market Street. Just to have the audience to begin to think about these spaces that we exist in and how we've existed in these legacies of violence and isolation. Um, this is another image um, that I did for the exhibition that again is, um, I'm going deeper into the space. Um, and so there was um, a school there that a white man had, his name was Moses Combs. And he would also allow blacks um, or African-Americans to study at the school. Um, one of the things though, is that Moses Combs is considered to be the father of New York economics. And, um, and that's all from the story of him selling 200 pairs of shoes to this man in the South. One of the things I'm exploring in the work now is that potentially those 200 shoes were possibly stolen. I mean, sold for African-American enslaved people in the South. So with this image, I am, I'm able to kind of explore Moses' comb story. So he becomes this kind of savior, right? Because he has these African-American folks that he teaches at the school, but also that he potentially was made wealthy and, and created his wealth off of the backs of African-Americans um, picking, picking cotton in the South, and as well as the violence and torture um, that is a part of what folks call slavery, which is actually the system of rape, torture, and other violence. This is another image you all might um, recognize. This is the um, former alumni field that is now the Frederick Douglass Field um, in downtown um, on the campus in Newark. Um, and so as you can see, I've depicted Frederick Douglass oversized because his story almost trumps the African-Americans who had the school and taught and they fought against slavery there. Um, and so, um, 
So as the final piece, one of the things is I would just love to have you all, if you want to explore some of these current things I'm working on now um, at the website, Black Power 19th Century. Um, but for now, I'm just going to close out with showing you a clip of the video that I have on the site and it's available on YouTube too. So um, please bear with me. I think I'll only play like um, two minutes of it. Because I know sometimes there's a lag with Zoom. For sale, black woman, about 27 years of age, a slave for life. Also a female child aged two years. The woman is a healthy, good natured, good cook, or would suit a farmer, being more or less accustomed to that work. The owner is going out of the state, and the woman ran away, but is now confined in Newark jail. Under these circumstances, the woman and her child will be sold at $100. Apply to Jafia Harrison. Newark, March 26, So um, one of the things I forgot to say for the video is that um, for that historical record that I show in the beginning of it, is that that's the actual site where the woman was enslaved with her daughter. Um, and it was either in that jail space or on the first floor. So for us, um, creating the piece, so and why I felt it was so important to show it today was this act of going into a site and creating and responding to the story of the site um, is a very important part to what I feel should be a part of our public humanities art history reclamation work um, now. And um, even for this piece, I would have never chosen Ava Maria at all. <laughs> it, I have no historical relationship to it. It's not a soulful song. So, but it kept calling for me 
to um, be a part of this piece. And then strangely with uh, Vanessa, but with um, Janetta Maria Miranda, who's the vocalist performer for the piece, this was actually one of the favorite songs of her mother. But the way that we decided to do it was do the original German poem. And then after I read the original German poem about this mother who was in this cave, I, I just, I was, I was bowled over that the spirit had translated this song to me I never had a connection to, and that it truly did have some kind of call and response with the space. So um, I'll just leave it at that. Please visit the website if you want to view the rest of the video as, as a lot in another video that's um, another environmental video that we did. So thank you, and I look forward to the rest of the presentation. Thank you so much, Noel. I mean, uh, I'm just, I have, you know, goosebumps now after also hearing your um, contextualization of the piece and mm -hmm. um, just like it was so compelling to see the sites. Also, several of us are from Newark and just seeing like the streets and then just that overlay of narrative of what, you know, had happened. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, I'm going to turn to Tamia presently. I'm just going to briefly introduce her. Um, so Tamia Han is an artist scholar who has devoted her life to the understanding of embodied cultural knowledge. She's a performer of experimental performance art. Um, Shakahachi, which is, uh, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, Japanese bamboo flute, Nihon Boyo, which is uh, Japanese traditional dance. And Tamia is a transmission specialist, fascinated by how embodied knowledge is transmitted. Her ethnographic research and performance spans a wide uh, range of areas, studies and topics, including senses and transmission, gesture, meditation, um, okia kogoto, sorry, I'm really butchering everything, um, Japanese practice arts, monster truck rallies, I was, thought that was interesting, uh, multiracial identity, issues of display and uh, relationships of technology and culture. And her work is cited as contributing to the sensory turn in scholarly research, specifically her monograph, Sensational Knowledge Embodying Culture Through the um, Japanese Dance, uh, which was awarded uh, the Alan P. Miriam Prize for the Society of Ethnomusicology, for which she is now the interim um, president. And Tamiya's forthcoming book is Arousing Sense, Re Recipes for Workshopping Sensory Experience, and it's expected to come out in the fall, October, 2021. So welcome Tamiya, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I am sharing my screen. Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Great. Super, super. So I've written this out so that I have something in front of me. <laughs> um, these are the things I've been thinking about, specifically wanted to pose for us today. At the very end, we have a really mini um, workshop um, as part of this, but I'm gonna show you some of my work um, before we get there. So um, considering the body as a field site, I ask how do individuals and communities embody and then express a sense of place because there is an endless sea of sensory information that we are immersed in at any given time uh, any moment noticing what you're aware of and what is filtered reveals and situates your reality your sensibility sound and movement provide emplacing qualities that orient and shape identity the senses as pathways of transmission orient bodies in real and figurative ways, revealing intersectional signifiers of cultural, social, gender, age, racial, and political sense scapes. The reality of becoming part of the landscape through the senses, imbibing the scene, cultivates an embodiment of place and yet Meandering through landscapes, we also alter them with our very presence. Come on, move down. There we go. 
how we comprehend, sense, and treat our surroundings deeply affects us in a wide variety of ways. Let's consider things appear differently depending on where we stand. Things appear differently depending on who we are. Things appear differently depending on what we are able to notice. The moment to moment sensual experiences you have encountered in your life run deep. That's embodiment, that's transmission. The notion of one's point of view, and please note the visual leaning term, gestures to a paradox that we cannot assume that what we experience is the same as someone else's experience. So here I need to give you a little bit of background. Um, I self-identify as multiracial. I grew up partially in, in Tokyo uh, and Kyoto and then, um, and then in the States. Um, I am um, gonna show you some performance and ethnography. I'm an ethnographer and ethnomusicologist and dance scholar. Um, and as uh, you've already learned, I'm, in, I'm um, devoted to uh, the senses and the sensory flow, which is also about transmission, both uh, how we, uh, we take in information and how we sense what's, quote, out there in the world, right? Um, so here is a picture uh, to the right of my teacher, headmaster Tachibana Yoshie, and um, just a picture of us in the, in the studio before um, before a lesson. Um, just to give you a flash background of, of what's going on, um, I started studying traditional Japanese dance when I was four in, uh, in Tokyo. So um, that runs into how, uh, how we arrive here. This is uh, an older piece of mine, uh, but it, it dwells on um, embodiment and place. Uh, this piece has um, the qualities of uh, Japanese traditional dance yet is absolutely experimental. There's no aspect of it, but in a way this um, embodies how um, we can tap embodied knowledge. So as we're sensing the world and we're, we're taking it in like sponges, here's an example of how I'm thinking artists can then tap what is embodied and then uh, have a, a flow of that in our expressivity, whether it's, um, whether it's visual art or in this case, um, a performance piece. Here I'm wearing sensors on my body and that's creating the sound that you hear, that I hope you hear because the sound is very, very low. I'll show you um, just a portion of this. A uh, piece is called Streams and it's a collaboration with a uh, composer uh, Curtis Bond, who also made the interface. Continuous desire.
I'm going to stop that here and move on. Come on. There we go. So the same interface was used for a number of pieces. This piece is, um, is um, a character called Pika Pika um, that I did for many years. Um, one iteration of the piece is um, with uh, robots that are musical robots built by Ajay Kapoor. And um, my interface is um, communicating with the robots so that we play, um, in this case, there's two robots on stage, uh, trios. Um, and this character was built um, upon the, the notion of a, an anime uh, character, but I'm not gonna go into this um, today. So um, just giving you a, a photo view of it. Um, monster trucks. Here's um, a case where um, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the notion of um, of the messiness of being biracial, of being multiracial, because people uh, always seem to uh, contextually um, and relationally. Uh, identify and want to consistently put one in uh, a particular pocket or or identity, but um, biracial identity is a is a very interesting um, uh, scape to be in, <laughs> landscape to to embody. This is a particularly non Asian uh, setting, so I wanted to to show it. Uh, I did uh, ethnography with monster truck builders, interviewed them, and um, here's just uh, an on-site uh, view. Um, my book, Sensational Knowledge, which um, Alex just talked about. And then uh, I have a book coming out in the fall called uh, Arousing Sense, and it's uh, a book of 34 plus sensory prompts. So uh, urging people to create work based upon uh, the sensory information that they're uh, taking in um, all the time. So let's see, where are we? Um, I wanted to show some visual artwork. So this is a really nice way to hook into um, Noel's work where uh, there is this dreamlike quality, but also a depth to interpretation. Of, of spaces and places. Um, here's a piece that uh, it, it necessitates a little further explanation, but I'm, I'm actually not going to go into it too, too deeply. Um, when I was a child, I learned how to do um, traditional calligraphy uh, and I learned under um, uh, a Buddhist uh, reverend uh, Shun Ching Kang. And uh, I recently, when my father died several years ago, my uh, father gave me a big bag of these um, childhood um, calligraphy. And I almost threw them out, but uh, you'll see how um, I ended up uh, actually um, moving with them. And uh, the orange is uh, his. Uh, I guess, correction work or, or display work. Whoops, there we go, here we go.
And I'll continue on here. I would like everyone to sit back and relax. Let's have a, um, a prompt, a, a sensory prompt as our um, creative little workshop today. If you have a sheet of paper nearby, uh, grab it with a writing implement. Otherwise, uh, use your, your cell phone or anything that you're able to um, scroll on, <laughs> even if it's typing into your computer. So here's a sensory prompt of a photo that I took. And I would like you to um, just enjoy looking at it and thinking about the other sensory, maybe tactile, heat, cool, other qualities that um, you might be feeling from it in a sensory uh, way, in a somatic way and let your mind wander. So if everyone can join me just for a moment uh, to sit uh, and breathe in, hold it at the top. And exhale, letting the shoulders drop. And take a moment to really look around at the picture. I just realized that you have access to chat, I think. And if so, you can write one or two words in the chat and share that with us. Just something that you, um, a response. And nothing is wrong, by the way. So just share something, or if you're feeling like that's not what you're interested in today, then privately just, um, write something or draw something on a little pad nearby. And that Wonderful. We have chat contributions. Oftentimes, by the way, I take the chat and I create a poem from the, the offerings given. So um, I'll ask uh, Alex or, or Colleen, someone uh, to save the chat for me, and then um, I'll gift it back once, um, once I, I've had my way with um, with it. Um, and I guess I should stop there. Um, I have, I have other things that, um, we could share, but I don't, um, I would rather, I would rather have a, a larger exploratory chat with, with Noel. Great. Um, thank you so much, Tamia. Um, there's so much uh, to be talking about, and thank you for bringing us through that exercise. Love to talk more about it. In fact, um, so now we're going to be ending our live stream Facebook um, portion. So thank you for those who have joined us on Facebook. Um, and so I'm going to end that right here. But we're going to uh, now break and let me see.